New Year and welcome back to Pager in 2021. So in this episode, Professor Paul Fletcher joins us to discuss all things relating to psychosis. Paul is both a psychiatrist and a professor of neuroscience at the University of Cambridge. His research is focused on the nature of perception and learning in psychiatric diseases, in particular those which can involve psychosis. Notably for a neuroscientist, he was also part of the five-time BAFTA-winning team which developed the video game Hellblade Sonoma's Sacrifice, uh, which was widely acclaimed for its exploration of psychosis via its main character. In our discussion, we explore what psychosis is, what it isn't, and the real diversity that exists in this field. We also touch upon some of the misconceptions held about it. We talk about the effects of psychosis on those who experience it, stigma surrounding mental health issues, Further through the episode, we turn our attention to attention itself and how we make sense of very complex stimuli coming from the outside world. This brings us on to talking about the predictive powers of the brain, the balance between accuracy and processing time, and distinguishing between things happening inside and outside the brain. Finally, a quick plug from me. If you like this podcast, then do share it with your friends, your family, your colleagues as a quick review makes a big difference. Right, so Professor Fletcher, thanks so much for joining me today. It's, uh, it's really kind of you. It's a pleasure. Nice to meet you. Thanks for asking me. I've stolen this question from the beginning of a couple of lectures that you gave that I watched online and found really interesting. But I thought it was an important one to start off with. And it's how exactly do we define psychosis? What exactly is it? Uh, well, t- psychosis is is relatively easy to define, although um, it's an incredibly complex s- state of mind. But strictly speaking, it, it refers to when somebody is separate from objective reality that other people have. So when they when they have a an experience of reality that doesn't accord with with the people around them, and it usually um, is further defined in terms of particular symptoms. So those are abnormal seemingly irrational beliefs called delusions and perceptions uh, that can occur in any of the sensory modalities that that don't seem to accord with external reality and those are called hallucinations. And does this appear to be kind of a sliding scale or an almost all or nothing event here because we often hear that we we all inhabit our own individual realities and our perceptions are our own perceptions of all the stimuli that are coming from the external world. Yeah, I I mean, that's a great point, I think. So most of us now believe that to some extent we are constructing our own reality based upon our sensory inputs. And as such, being the imperfect creatures that we are, we're probably all to some extent uh, inhabiting a reality that doesn't quite accord with, with objective facts about the environment. You know, that, that's okay. We, we get by, but by and large, um, psychosis itself is is when that reality really that somebody has constructed is potentially harmful to them or they suffer because of it and so although it's you know it's easy to think of it as a sort of continuum at the same time it's important to recognize that some people in a truly psychotic state really are in a very different state of mind uh, and probably occupy a, a particular a unique position that was going to be almost one of my one of my next questions because we we hear psychosis and we hear this very kind of negative term and it's often particularly when we use the word psychotic it's often associated with kind of violence and um a dangerous mm. state but what you're saying here almost suggests that yes psychosis is um this is almost by definition something that negatively affects an individual but is that always the case yeah, well, I mean, another good question. So I suppose, you know, coming at it from the perspective of a psychiatrist, I tend to see people who are presenting to the doctor for one reason or another because something has gone wrong. Uh, and as such, I see people in a psychotic state for whom that state is, is really quite detrimental to their own well-being. Now, that's not to say that people inevitably suffer because of psychosis, and it may well be that there are people out there with very seemingly irrational beliefs, experiencing hallucinations, hearing voices, who wouldn't really consider themselves ill and who don't require um, any, any treatment. So I, I think it's important to firstly acknowledge that it's not always uh, mm-hmm. a negative experience. And also this, this, um, this point you made about uh, you know, people generally um, 
seeing it as a you know a, a dangerous or violent state of mind that that's certainly untrue and in fact people are people with psychotic mental illness are more likely to be harmed by others than they are to uh, mm-hmm. exert harm on on those others i wonder if this is a almost a product of the the famous cases or kind of hollywood hollywood style depictions of us and the ones that come most to mind which are probably i imagine rare in the big scheme of things because psychosis is quite a common condition or feature or yeah. set of symptoms rather yeah i mean it's been estimated by mental health uk that one percent of people might have some sort of psychotic episode in their life and and actual isolated psychotic phenomena such as hallucinations are probably much much more common and we've all experienced them to some extent i agree with you that um general depictions uh, in film and television can can be very harmful in that they, you know, I, I think people sometimes use it as a rather lazy way of motivating a character to be violent or to be irrational. Uh, you know, they, they put it all down to mental illness. And, you know, the reality is that people with psychosis are struggling to make sense of their world and doing their utmost to to live with these experiences that they have aren't uh, violent, unpredictable creatures at all. They're, they're suffering and, and doing their best. Do individuals typically have insight into the fact that their experience of reality is different to that of those around them or is potentially inaccurate? I mean, this can really vary. So, you know, one of the, th- the things I've learned about psychosis is that although there are certain commonalities such as we talked about already um, the individual's experience of it is often very very unique and so I've, I've certainly seen people who particularly in the early stages question their own experiences and beliefs they realize that things aren't as they should be and so they have this this ability to introspect and to say well I, I you know this this sounds uh, this sounds irrational to me and so I don't I don't necessarily believe it is the case or they may question whether the voices that they hear truly reflect reflect other agents uh, but but in extremists when somebody's fully immersed in the, their psychotic construction of the world then it can be very difficult for them to, to step outside that and to see how other people view it so you know that the, the short answer is there is a real continuum between having these isolated experiences that one recognizes as being unreal to the opposite end where somebody might just fully believe in and act upon their psychotic beliefs and experiences. And we're going to touch upon expectations um, and how the brain deals with prediction, um, hopefully a bit later on in the episode. But I was, I was wondering here whether actually your, mm. an individual's expectations of what they should be experiencing plays plays a role here in that uh, I'm almost thinking of somebody with mirages and having hallucinations in in the desert very dehydrated um, or mm. maybe taking a recreational drug might very much expect um, to and recognize that they are perhaps perceiving a slightly different reality to those around them whereas somebody with a chronic mental condition um, may not yeah yeah that's absolutely right so people People can get quite psychotic on certain drugs, particularly hallucinogens, um, but they they always have this background explanation uh, that what they're experiencing is a consequence of a pharmacological disruption that they themselves have have assented to. I think a key difference in somebody with who's suffering psychosis as as part of a mental illness is that it's often a very insidious onset so that their world changes relatively slowly and they don't have this background explanation for why it's happening and so their conclusion is usually that it's because of the world because because this is um, how the world is rather than attributing it internally. When we're talking about mental illnesses that cause psychosis what are we normally referring to? Schizophrenia comes to mind um, as one example. Yeah, so the classic uh, diagnostic category that um, is associated with with psychosis is schizophrenia, and it's important to to remember that um, you know the, the two terms aren't interchangeable. You know, psychosis is a bit like a, a set of symptoms or experiences, and schizophrenia is the illness within which 
that psychosis might occur. Um, other conditions are things like uh, you know, bipolar affective disorder. People who are severely depressed can, can get quite nasty psychotic experiences. Drugs uh, can cause psychosis. I, I think, although it's often not referred to as psychosis, people in a sort of neurological or state of physical illness can actually become delirious or can become confused and, and will experience hallucinations and delusions. So it, it's, a, it's a set of symptoms that can really spread across, across multiple different diagnoses. I know you've done a lot of work in, in this field and um, one of the um, rather interesting things in fact, that you've been part of is designing a video game actually that has been kind of widely acclaimed for its depictions of psychosis and the experiences i know you worked with a lot of people on that so could you tell me a bit about about that i think I, i'm going to butcher the name of it but hellblade sanoa's sacrifice yes i'm happy to talk about that um i mean the, the, the background to this is one of the things i think that's re- can be really awful about psychosis and serious mental illness generally is that it's in its very nature to make people different from those around them you know they believe different things they act in different ways they they experience different reality uh, and a consequence of that is that they can become horribly and stigmatized and treated like they're really uh, mm. not a normal human and so when i was i was approached about four years ago by a, a cambridge video game design studio called ninja theory and they said they were making a game in which the lead character um, suffered from hallucinations and delusions, and they wanted to, to get it right. You know, I, I thought this was a great opportunity to, to be part of a respectful, uh, thoughtful representation of, of psychotic experiences, and also to reach, um, to reach a group of individuals who maybe wouldn't necessarily in, otherwise engage with this as, a, as a, an experience. So, you know, gamers, um, perhaps it's not, it's not top of their list of things to learn about. Um, and so, yeah, the, the, the game involved lots and lots of discussions. Um, um, I introduced the game development team to people who had lived experience of psychosis. We had lots of discussions about the nature of the experience, and that all went into the game. Going back to what you said earlier about everyone's experiences being potentially dramatically different from one another's um, with psychosis, how did, you, how did you approach that, that angle almost, um, if you had to... Uh, pick out one experience amongst a number of them or craft that? Yeah, well, I I suppose the purpose of the game was not to provide a sort of textbook representation of all of the possible features of psychosis, but to tell the story of a person who is experiencing delusions and hallucinations um, that are peculiar to themselves. You know, they're part of their own um, construction, but that they they were to some extent representative of the sorts of experiences that somebody with psychosis might have. So, you know, in order to, to get at that, there was a lot of discussion of the science, a lot of the discussion of the theories about how, say, hallucinations might occur, but also very specific discussion with a number of uh, people who'd, who'd had or were having hallucinations. And just, I think the, the team really picked from that um, a set of, ideas that they then built into the character Senua. So overall it was the story of one person, the hero of the game, and it wasn't trying to be a story of everybody with psychosis. And I think by 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 taking that approach they managed to, you know, create a believable hero. Mm, and very successfully. Um, based on the number of sales indeed. Yeah, well, the sales were... I mean, when, when I first um, approached them, they, they, they really thought that this was going to be not a commercial success. They were doing it because they believed in it. And they thought that if they broke even, um, then that would be great, but they didn't even expect to do that. But as it turned out, um, you know, they, sales and awards and everything exceeded everything that had been expected. And for, for me and for them, one of the, the most rewarding things was the sorts of conversations it started online about the nature of psychosis Um, a number of people well a lot of people um, discussed what it meant to them to be able to show their relatives a game and say you know this is this is what it's like Mm. I imagine differs quite a lot from papers that you've authored 
on the topic and some uh, rather uh, almost impenetrable um, kind of scientific descriptions of um, of psychosis that I imagine doesn't resonate with a lot of people. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, we, we all want, we go into science and medicine because we want to have an impact. And, you know, I've been writing papers for years and probably read by about 10 people, some of them. And yet to be part of this where, you know, thousands and thousands of people were playing it. Well, millions of copies were sold um, and huge conversations opening up, uh, you know, the reporters uh, reviewing the game and describing their own experiences of mental illness. It really felt like a, a very impactful thing to be involved in. I, was, I felt very proud of it. I defend writers of paper by, papers by saying, even if 10 people, and I'm sure it's more than 10 people, end up reading a paper that <laughs> could go on to do uh, very important things um, with it. Oh, yeah. yeah. So I mean, we, we all... It's linking things. Yeah, no, I appreciate that point. And, I, uh, you know, I'm, I'm happy to be rude about my own papers, but I'm sure... Um, you know, lots of people write technical treatises that have a huge impact on, on, on the world. I mean, what, one of the, the nice things about this was that there are papers that I've read from the 60s describing uh, psychotic experiences in, in, in the words of those who've had them. And to be able to take those and convey them to the game makers and, and watch them embed those into the game itself was very rewarding because it really brought them to life. You, uh, you're a psychiatrist um, by background, you trained in medicine, and almost we have two groups of people. We have people communicating with people who have had psychotic episodes in the past and perhaps people who are continuing to experience them. How do you effectively communicate with people if they, do, if they are perhaps experiencing and believing a different reality to the one that most of us would say that we experience? Yeah, I mean, that, that, that's a a great question and it's a very difficult one and I think it's something that a lot of medical students struggle with initially when they're doing their psychiatry placements. I mean I think the, the general principle there's no right or wrong way to do it but I think a general principle is to listen to people describe their reality and to accept that this is their reality. Mm. You know not not to dismiss it or to directly challenge it but to just acknowledge that yes this is what the world is like for you and and i think if you take that as a starting point a sort of res respectful acceptance well not necessarily you know you don't accept their reality but you accept that it is real for them mm. um then I, I think that's the starting point for the conversation and i wonder how that links in with if you are trying to challenge parts of their reality because as you said you often see um patients who at the extreme end of things are suffering quite a lot from particular kind of beliefs that they might hold. How do you, mm. how do you go about challenging um, some of them? Obviously not challenging them all, but if that is, is that even necessary to um, improve their lives? Yeah, it's a, it's, it's, it's a good question because I think, you know, by the, often by the time you as a psychiatrist see someone, they have, um, they've built their life around this new reality. And Although it might seem very dysfunctional to the outside, it may, it may actually be for them a way of being, a way of existing in the mm. world. And you need to be very careful about just trying to, you know, pull, pull that away. Um, I mean, my, my feeling is that you should test their reality. You should challenge them by saying, look, this doesn't sound plausible or what you're saying doesn't accord with what your wife is saying or, or whatever. So how do you explain that? But what you'll often find is, is that somebody is so deeply entrenched in the belief that you're not, you're not going to be able to argue them out of it and it's a mistake to try. And then it's really a case of asking yourself, well, you know, w what is making this person suffer? You know, because in some cases, people are happy with their beliefs and their ways of being and they're not any harm to themselves or others. Although there's always the danger that you know, their condition might deteriorate. But I think if you can put your finger on what it is that's causing them to suffer, um, are they frightened? Are they um, neglecting themselves? Are they so, so fearful of their persecutor that they won't go out the door? Then you have to start to think about how you can mitigate that. And that may involve, um, well, it, it always involves support uh, and a degree of um, sort of sympathetic listening. And it may involve uh, antipsychotic medication. 
which is generally a you know blockade of dopamine function and then there are other forms of cognitive therapies that may be helpful in in allowing people to deal with their their experiences mm. and i wonder whether touching on something you said just at the beginning of that we can almost put this divide between those who are <clears throat> well, psychologically healthy and those who who aren't and saying oh well people have irrational irrational beliefs and you can't argue them out of it whereas actually i think the majority of us have a lot of beliefs that even when challenged mm. with quite strong evidence we put yeah. our brain power to justifying our previous our previous point of view and previous position i don't think that's mm. necessarily unique to psychiatric illness i completely agree i mean i think beliefs form in us uh, as a as a way of you know as a prism through which we look at the world and it's very it's very difficult to challenge that in anybody you know they, they they don't just form overnight they're usually the result of experience and of ways of interpreting things and once a belief is formed it, it serves a purpose you know it's a it's part of the framework through which we understand the world so removing it under any circumstances is difficult and i i, I agree with the, the point implicit in your question that there's something about beliefs in general that is sort of mildly irrational to say the least yes and mm -hmm. i think it's probably leads on nicely to looking a bit more into the the mechanisms behind psychosis and our our understanding of it mm. because i guess i was thinking from what you just said that one of the reasons that beliefs are irrational they almost have to be irrational because for something to be entirely rational and to be entirely based on evidence requires such processing power and taking no shortcuts there that actually mm. we're almost required to um, to do this in the way that the brain um, experiences the world, you can't pay attention to everything. This definitely links into into some of the work that that you've done relating to our expectations and how we take in different stimuli and don't take in other ones. So I was wondering if you could tell me a bit about that. Yeah, sure. Um, the basic premise is a simple one, and I think you put it yourself quite nicely. You know, we we, we have this profoundly difficult challenge which is we need to understand the world around us based upon some fairly rudimentary but very noisy and intensive sensory inputs and those those are largely um you know they need to be reconstructed because they're just they're just telling us about heat light force chemical composition of the world around us and mm. somehow we need to build up a, a model of that world and it's generally accepted that you can't possibly do it based just on the evidence itself. You need to bring to bear um, your own prior knowledge so that you can make the best guess, the best inference about what the world is really like out there. And so what that introduces is this simple idea that um, our, our inferences, uh, whether those inferences are perceptual experiences or high-level beliefs, they're, they're a combination of what the world is telling us and what we already believe. And that, as a consequence, we are continually constructing our, our, our reality based upon prior experiences. Um, and what that introduces then is this balance. So, you know, when, when should we rely on what we already know and when should we listen to the world and, you know, if, if it's disagreeing with what, what we already know? So you have this continuous um, need to both be good predictors, but at the same time be sensitive and flexible to, um, to inputs from the world, while at the same time recognizing that um, you'll never be a perfect predictor because there's always going to be noise in the system. And there may be instances where the world seems to be telling you something different, um, but actually, you shouldn't really update your belief. I mean, the, the analogy I give is, imagine you've got a, a sort of scatter plot uh, where the points are all, you know, where there's a good correlation, but the points are not quite in a straight line. But you draw a straight line through that anyway. Uh, and that's, that's your belief about the relationship between the two variables. Now, you're not really troubled by the fact that not every point lies on that line because you accept that there's going to be noise. And if you've got another, you know, another few points and they weren't quite on that line, you wouldn't necessarily then redraw the line. You would just accept that the belief 
and the correlation is right and that the noise is just causing these small errors and i hope that's not too too labored uh, an analogy but it's i think it's sort of the you know what we're trying to achieve in in finding this perfect balance between predictions and inputs putting together in my mind almost two two different scenarios here you have for example if you're looking at the classic kind of example of if you're looking at a chair it might take multiple different forms and you need to be able to recognize mm -hmm. it for what it is at different locations different angles different colors but then also in some scenarios we need to think more probabilistically and mm -hmm. um, even if, if if something is say right nine out of ten times just because it's uh, it isn't what you think it is one out of ten times that might still be um, a decent probability to go to go forwards with and continue with that belief system and you can't let the kind of the the occasional events that don't match your belief system disrupt your entire kind of thinking which might be actually very beneficial um, around it yeah, I think I think you've put very nicely that into words just why we have so many biases and heuristics and and things like that which is uh, we take we take mental shortcuts based upon prior experience and prior knowledge and we accept to some extent that those won't always those won't always uh, be factually correct but over the course of time they will actually prove to be the best strategy for engaging with the world um, and and you know to get back to the point you made earlier what one of the one of the huge um, benefits of that is efficiency so you don't need to reprocess every, everything from scratch you rely on what's gone before and you can take a great leap forward in terms of time and you know reducing the actual neural work that you have to do although on the other hand it can be quite dangerous at times or disadvantageous if yeah. your predictions go astray i think what we have here is a system that works generally very well for us but it's in a state of very fine balance and you know i i, I think that psychosis hallucinations things like that they are a consequence sometimes of just a very fine imbalance or a very subtle imbalance in that system and you know the if you if you think of something like a delusion an irrational belief that your neighbor is trying to harm you um, if you have that as your belief then that's how you will that will form the prism that uh, determines how you how you evaluate all of the evidence that's coming in so everything you see your neighbor doing might then be interpreted according to that belief Mm, and we'll feed so in into this it. instance it sorry and we'll feed into it as well and exactly yeah mm. so the belief creates the evidence that supports the belief and i think that's that's one of the big dangers of a system like this as, as you've said it, it has its drawbacks even though generally it's efficient and useful and does this we've we talked a bit about actually how these beliefs can progress and how someone's mental state can potentially deteriorate does this point mm -hmm. to actually the importance of early intervention um, to prevent this to an extent so I, I i think it depends on what the underlying mechanism of the psychosis might be so one thing we, we know very little really about actual mechanisms by which psychosis can occur but we know a, we know a fair bit about some of the risk factors and things so one major risk factor is childhood trauma. Um, now, it may well be that somebody who suffers a later psychosis as a consequence of that is experiencing a very different mechanism from somebody who has, say, a neurodevelopmental uh, problem that's causing a schizophrenia-like syndrome, or somebody who has an autoimmune, um, you know, receptor antibody. Um, problem that's causing a, an encephalitis or a, or you know or, a, or one of these autoimmune psychoses so in some cases I think early pharmacological intervention is really crucial in other cases early intervention for support and you know dealing with let's say with childhood trauma is also crucial um, but I do I do feel that there may be instances where people have 
what's clearly a psychotic state of mind, but just aren't going to deteriorate. And there, I suppose, early intervention might not be so crucial. So all in all, I mean, it's, it's difficult to, to give a general rule, um, but it, it may well depend on what the mechanism is that's causing the psychosis. And I wonder in this case, when we talk about deterioration, do we have mm -hmm. two different categories? Do we have deterioration of the actual um, psychotic symptoms? People are perhaps experiencing more of them in different sensory modalities. And also, as we alluded to before, deterioration in that other beliefs have been kind of based and built upon these experiences to the extent that actually individuals are much uh, are suffering much more because of it but actually the almost the new beliefs are built on perfectly normal mechanisms yeah that, that i think that's a really important point and it's often neglected um and you, you put it very nicely there so i i think it's very important not to think of psychosis as cro cross-sectionally you know what it is is an experience of the world which then determines what your future experiences of the world will be because right. it it's the Sort of repertoire of explanations that you have and so it's a dynamic process where you know the actual symptoms may not be necessarily getting more severe but the actions that you take as a consequence of that symptom are putting you in new new situations uh, causing you to interpret evidence in different ways so that you may get more and more isolated more and more frightened even though the underlying if you like, mechanism psychosis is not necessarily getting worse. Mm. So, I mean, that, I'm, I'm really glad you raised that point because I, I think it's very, very important to bear in mind that, um, you know, psychosis affects the way in which we, we deal with the world and the way in which we deal with the world then affects our future well-being and our future relationships and things like that. Mm. So do we see people who actually come out of because often we see um in schizophrenia for example these positive symptoms aren't present all the time um do you mm. see people coming out of um psychotic episodes but still retaining actually some quite disadvantageous belief structures that dictate how they live their lives yeah i, I mean I, I, as with uh, the previous question i think i think you know a lot of it boils down to mechanisms so you you can, you can have individuals who have a brief one-off psychotic episode maybe in their late adolescence early adulthood they recover from it not necessarily with treatment and they never have it again uh, and you know they they can remember it and they um they remember the beliefs and the experiences but they they no, no longer believe in them whereas other people can have a relapsing and remitting course as might be typical for schizophrenia where the, the, the positives, as you've referred to, the positive symptoms, the delusions and hallucinations may wax and wane. They may disappear completely, but it's still possible that that person is suffering cognitive problems or is uh, finding it difficult to motivate themselves, to look after themselves. They're not achieving their full potential. Um, so, you know, something like schizophrenia in its classic form would, would, be, like, would be like that. Mm. I think I'll add, I should have mentioned it earlier, that by, by positive symptoms, we have a slightly different meaning in that we're talking about the presence of um, symptoms that are not present in um, psychologically normal individuals, whereas negative we take as a lack of normal things. So I don't know, a lack of enjoyment um, of yeah. life or um, a lack of speech, whereas a positive symptom might be, say, a hallucination that others don't have. Um, yeah, yeah. So it's, uh, it's <laughs> confusing terminology, isn't it? It doesn't mean positive in the sense that it's good. It means it's positive in that it's positively present. I wanted to touch upon actually uh, another, well, a really interesting thing that I was reading that uh, you wrote about how the brain distinguishes between these externally received stimuli from the outside world and these internally generated stimuli. Perhaps it's almost best to start with how it works normally for us um, and then lead on to how it could lead to these hallucinations whether auditory or visual it's a question that often seems a little bit sort of irrational when you first pose it um, but it's a it's a very important one which is if if i if i 
do something that makes for a change in the world, a change in my sensory input, then how do I know that it was me rather than the world? How, how do I have the sense that I, I controlled it and produced it rather than uh, it's something that the external world has, has done to me? And it's an important question because one of the, the core symptoms of schizophrenia can be so-called delusions of control, where somebody will, will take actions, they'll move their arm, they'll smile or whatever, and they'll become convinced that they it wasn't them who authored that action. So it will feel like they're being controlled from the outside. And that's led to this, this question, what, what are the hallmarks of internally generated versus externally generated uh, experiences, as you, as you said? And it, it's more general than just delusions of control. So a hallucination is thought to be an inner voice that is perceived as being external, as coming from the outside world and is therefore heard as an external voice rather than one's own inner, inner voice. For me, it seems that um, the core difference between uh, internally and externally produced changes is their predictability. Because if you've done it, if you've authored an action, then you have the advantage of expecting its consequences. Mm. Whereas if it's come from the outside, you don't. And, and you know, a lot of work in, in the field of psychosis has been trying to get at this distinction between um, predictable and unpredictable outcomes. I think we've all experienced that from time to time. I don't know when we brush past something and knock it over, particularly, mm. I think, when um, almost in the dark, for example, when other sensory inputs that allow us to predict what's going to happen are absent. Um, and it takes us yeah. a, perhaps a fraction of a second to realize we jump and we have a burst of adrenaline um, before we realize that actually, no, that was something that I initiated myself. Yeah, absolutely. And I think you make a great point there about, you know, some sensory cues being removed. So the feeling is that in making this distinction between internally and externally produced actions or outcomes, we have a number of different cues in different domains. So, you know, we often have the, the internal cue that, yes, I intended to make this action. We also have the uh, external cue that I, I felt my hand move uh, or I felt it pick up the thing I wanted to pick up. Um, and also the external cue that I saw my hand move and I saw it pick this up and so forth. Um, it may be that a number of different cues have to be integrated in quite a complex way in order to, to be able to draw the conclusion, yes, I did this. Uh, and it may be that under certain circumstances, so to allude to, if you're in the dark or if you're wearing a pair of gloves or, or anything that can sort of reduce the sensory precision, maybe that makes that a, a more difficult inference to make. And so it might be that under certain circumstances, it becomes harder to make this distinction between internal, yes, I did it, and external, um, experiences or externally generated experiences. The comparison between somebody, say, running through um, a forest um, or standing still in a forest. If you're if you're running through a forest and you're disrupting loads of undergrowth and stuff, and there are a few twitches that you didn't actually cause that were caused by something else, you probably wouldn't notice mm. them. You'd probably expect them to be, and you'd probably say, "Oh, okay, well, they're probably as a result of me bumping into something." Whereas if you're standing yeah. completely still anything that you know that um, there's nothing that you could have potentially done to the environment so are there scenarios where we generate if we generate a lot of kind of noise almost other things can get caught up in it that actually um are not uh initiated by us and whether that could play a role here so that's quite a convoluted question yeah no no i, I agree with that i, I think um you know we're, we're continually looking to infer the causes of our experiences and if if the experience is something like the sound of a twig snapping, um, then there's a huge difference when you're in a forest between running along and hearing it snap versus standing perfectly still and hearing it snap. You, you know, you're, that's a, a great example of where the internal versus externally caused um, experience is, can be very clearly delineated. Because if you haven't moved or if you haven't felt something under your foot, then it's much more likely that there's an external agent somewhere out there that's, that's done this. And, you know, we're taking these as examples um, of 
you know, as slightly caricatured examples to illustrate the points, but it's likely that we're engaged in this sort of inference all the time. And we're explaining away a lot of our experiences as being internally produced so that we can ignore them. Because that's the other thing is, you know, not only are internally produced sensory experiences uh, predictable, but also they're not that informative. So it's better not to be processing them and, you know, and worrying about them too much. And do we have any ideas of how this can change um, in psychotic episodes? How we, how we get this move from actually having an inner monologue that you recognise perhaps as your inner monologue and one that really is perceived as an external one? Well, nobody knows for sure what the mechanism really is. I mean, there, there, is, there's, there are some examples from the experimental literature suggesting that people with or prone to psychosis have a slightly different sensory experience of their own self-produced movements. So the classic example um, is the idea that you can't tickle yourself because, uh, because your own self-produced movements are so predictable that they just don't feel ticklish. Um, and there's been some work suggesting that people with schizophrenia might actually find their own movements relatively less predictable and therefore more tickle-inducing, if you like. There's also some, some nice work pointing out that uh, you know, when you uh, carry out an action that exerts a force on yourself, because you can predict the sensory consequences of that, you actually experience the force as being slightly weaker. In other words, if you, you know, if you, if you slap your own hand, it feels much lighter than if somebody else slaps your hand with the same force because theirs is more unpredictable and you can't cancel the consequences. And there's, there's some really interesting work suggesting that people with psychosis um, don't cancel that in the same way. They don't predict it in the same way. So they experience their own self-induced forces as being just as powerful as external forces. Um, but I, I'm mindful that I'm not really answering your question because you're asking about the mechanism and I just don't think we know it, you know, so we could speculate, but I... I almost wonder whether, again, bringing in some quite kind of mundane experiences that I have, whether it's about kind of lag time or being able to cancel out um, external um, forces and things mm. like that. And it's a, it's a strange example, but the idea actually I occasionally get asked in the... Um, in the kitchen to kind of hold, um, to uh, scoop something out of like a pan while somebody else is holding it mm. and, and tipping it, it over. And it's a very difficult thing because you push against it and then suddenly somebody else tries to produce an equally and opposite force to keep it in the same place. Was actually, if you do it all yourself, you know exactly, you know exactly what forces you're putting in. And yes, yeah. That exact moment that you need to counter. Yeah, and no, I think it, that's a really nice analogy. Um, and so much of the motor control is anticipation based. You know, you're actually making the, the minor adjustments in your in your movements, not at the time that they're needed, but slightly in advance of that. So you're anticipating yourself the whole time. Which I guess is very important when those stimuli are changing quite rapidly. It's not just like a, yeah. a, a force um, increases and remains constant for 10 seconds. It's um, in this case, it's probably varying uh, on the order of milliseconds in the same way that actually a, a visual stimulus is unlikely to remain the same. And so, so as an auditory one, you really do have to anticipate things rather than respond to them directly. Yeah. I mean, the, the, the great example uh, in the visual domain is, um, oh, I'm trying to think of the person who uses this, but it, uh, I, I can't remember the ana you know, who came up with the analogy, but uh, sort of back of the envelope calculation, if you were facing a serve from, in tennis from Serena Williams, then if you calculate, you know, how long it would actually take light from the ball to travel to your retina and then along the optic nerves and then into higher order visual cortex, you'd be actually about nine meters behind where the ball actually is by the time it reached you. So you'd be in real difficulty. So the, the only way to, to, to play that is to use your prior experience to bias you in terms of where the ball's going to be before you've actually been able to visually process it. Mm. So and I suspect that's yeah. happening a lot of the time. When people talk about professional sports players having lots of time, that's probably what they mean. Links back to, I remember being told about some studies with table tennis players and hearing that actually there was the expectation that they'd have fantastic reflexes. They found that they had, at best, slightly better reflexes than everybody else. But their predictions mm. were there. Mm. Yeah, I mean, any, any tennis player or you know, um, cricketer who relied on their reactions would be in deep trouble. 
they've got to be proactive in everything and predictive. And I wonder too, because we uh, again we have this we have this distinction between short term <laughs> and um, the short term sometimes one off psychotic episodes and these recurrent episodes as well. Do we do we know anything about why we get these? I mean, <clears throat> presumably it's due to due to the mechanism of it, but why mm. some individuals are really prone to recurrences? It's speculative. So there's a there's a genetic component clearly. There is a profound effect of early child early life experiences plus other social stresses like being a migrant, uh, one's one's social circumstances, long term unemployment, things like that social isolation and those those are all sort of come together to make psychotic breakdowns more or less likely depending on who you are and i suppose it's just you know it's a really complex set of ingredients that are mixed in unique ways across different individuals i think on top of that there are likely neurodevelopmental abnormalities in some cases you know abnormalities of synaptic pruning perhaps that makes makes one's brain more likely to 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 um be in a a, a state where these these precipitants or or uh, risk factors can can exert a greater effect so the problem is when you talk generally about psychosis it's a bit like talking generally about fever or it or generally about a cough there's just mm. so many possible underlying pathologies and in psychiatry of course it's not just the biological pathologies it's social and psychological ones so yeah i'm i'm, I'm spending a long time just not answering your question <laughs> no that's okay that's okay that's okay <laughs> no i spend um i spend quite a lot of time as a medical student i sometimes ask questions and then um even if you don't get an answer it's fine because you know that you don't need an answer if somebody who knows a lot about it doesn't know the answer to it then you're probably not expected <laughs> to, know it, to know it either right. that's very kind of you <laughs> how close are we because we we've talked about um psychosis or psychosis is often talked about as um very strongly delineated from um non-psychotic states mm. but the idea that you can go in and out of these states with seeming ease suggests that actually individuals might be you can be uh, how close are we to the edge of these experiences and um, i almost i'm thinking we we've all had the experience of thinking we've heard something perhaps or wondering mm. whether we've there's been this kind of low level stimulus that was that a product of our own imagination or not i think it's a really interesting question not not an easy one to answer I'm, i think that um you know we've, we've already alluded to this idea of a, a fine balance between uh, how we're predicting the world and what the world is telling us and I think it's almost impossible to get that right or if you do get it right it's almost impossible to get it consistently right um, for, for a whole range of reasons and I think different people will set their you know will calibrate themselves in different ways and it may be that there are certain psychological traits that make you more prone to um, having psychosis if if the circumstances are unfavorable. And we, we did a study a few years ago in which we looked at people's ability to see a figure in the midst of a very noisy background. Uh, and then we gave people some information that helped them to disambiguate that figure. And then we measured their performance after they'd had this information. What we found was that people who are more prone to psychosis, they weren't actually um, fully psychotic at the time of testing, but they were more prone to psychosis. Um, they actually are much better at doing this task, at using their expectations to, to pick out the figure in the, in the noisy image. And that suggests to me that actually under certain circumstances, what you have is a sort of trait or ability that can be advantageous under certain circumstances. But if you take it to another place or another set of circumstances, it might make you more prone to hallucinations, say, um, to seeing things that aren't there. It's almost, it's, it's sort of where you set your, your threshold. So mm. some people might actually be very resistant to hallucinations, but actually they're also pretty poor at using their, their prior expectations to, to pick out figures. Whereas other people 
are prone to hallucinations, but the advantage they get is that they're good at seeing patterns that other people can't see. It makes sense when, yeah, when we can say actually these, this is all about, about trade-offs. You could be very accurate at predicting the consequences of an action in a particular set of circumstances, but the price of that accuracy is when the circumstances change. Um, you're no longer very good. Yeah. I mean, artificial intelligence might be an example of that, um, particularly when applied in medicine, yeah. very good in certain circumstances, but then um, not very generalizable to out-of-context um, scenarios. Yeah, I think that puts it very nicely. I, I, I do think that um, the reason that we see a distribution of psychosis or psychotic-like experiences is that, um, is that people have their own unique blends or combinations of ways of uh, processing the world and some, some ways are, have advantages in one setting and disadvantages in another and vice versa. I think that's probably right now all we've got, it's exactly 12.30 so it's oh, probably yeah. all we've got time for right now but it's been a really really fascinating conversation so thank you so much for joining me, it's been very kind of you and I'm sure all our listeners will really enjoy this and give, it'll give them lots of food for thought. Oh, thanks. I really enjoyed your questions. Uh, it's been great meeting you and thanks for inviting me. Thanks for listening to the Pager Podcast. If you've enjoyed it, do leave us a review, share it with a friend and come back to listen to our other episodes. As ever, we'd love to hear what you think. You can reach us at Pager Podcast on Instagram and Twitter or email us at pagerpodcast at gmail.com. Bye for now.